The years 1920 to 1933 marked the time of prohibition in the United States. The 18th Amendment in 1920 rendered the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcoholic beverages illegal nationwide. This information has become common knowledge to the average American citizenry. However, why would Congress enact such a brazen amendment such as essentially the banning of such popular, abundant, and commercialized products such as alcohol? What was so inherently malevolent about alcohol that the government decided to ban it? What results were they planning to yield, and what ultimately led to the composition of a constitutional amendment in an attempt to create a dry America? The origins of the idea of a ban on alcohol are as old as the Republic itself. In 1657, Massachusetts experimented with prohibition by banning the sale of strong liquor. The Whiskey Rebellion in 1791-1794 was in response to taxes on whiskey in Pennsylvania. Social reformers at the time hoped that the tax would raise awareness of alcohol's negative effects. In general, many citizens viewed alcohol in excess and drunkenness as unacceptable, but drinking in moderation was not seen as anything dangerous. There was also societal views that differed between the genders. It was actually considered healthy for a man to have a couple of drinks, while at the same time women, especially women of the middle class, were the center of the home and its morale and were against the consumption of alcohol altogether. This may explain why early prohibition and temperance movements were majority female organizations. Benjamin Rush, a prominent and well-respected physician during the late 18th century, is cited as being a major influence in the early temperance movement. He wasn't a prohibitionist, but believed that drunkenness was a disease on society. In 1789, a group of 200 Connecticut farmers formed a temperance group influenced by Rush. This precipitated other temperance groups to form in several other states during the next couple decades. In 1826, a national temperance group was founded called the American Temperance Society. This organization gained lots of tracks in having approximately 1.5 million members in the 1830s. These temperance movements in the early 19th century consisted of majority female members and was heavily influenced by religious morals, especially the Methodist denomination. It is also during the early 19th century that these temperance movements broadened their goals from just general abstinence to overall prohibition. However, when the American Civil War broke out in 1861, the temperance and prohibition movement lost traction only to be picked up again by the National Prohibition Movement and the Women's Christians Temperance Movement. Kansas was the first state to implement prohibition legislation in its constitution. This introduces a peculiar character in the prohibition movement in the Midwest. Carrie Nation was a sort of prohibition vigilante in the late 1890s and 1900s. She was known for enforcing the Kansas state ban on alcohol by barging into saloons with a hatchet, destroying bottles of alcohol with it, and scalding customers. Also, her being 6 feet tall and 175 pounds only added to scaring people into not drinking. While Nation's tactics were rare, what was most popular in advocating the anti-drinking cause was much more mild. Groups would walk into saloons singing, praying, and imploring the establishment to stop selling alcohol. Other states also enacted prohibition legislation in subsequent years, and Maine and Vermont experimented with prohibition in the mid-1800s. Several Supreme Court cases also ruled in favor of prohibition legislation some salient cases being Mugler v. Kansas in 1887 and Crowley v. Christensen in 1890. These cases claim that the well-being, safety, morale, and health of society is heightened by the ban of alcohol. Despite the increase in traction in favor of prohibition after the Civil War, saloons became increasingly prevalent in integral to male social life. One tactic that saloons used to draw customers was a free lunch special. This is where the saloon would give out a free meal, typically something salty, so the customer would be inclined to buy a drink. This is where the expression, there's no such thing as a free lunch, originates from. The saloons were also seen as places for political corruption to proliferate in urban areas. Saloons in the cities were often frequented by the city's immigrant population. Politicians, eager to win over the important immigrant vote, would also frequent saloons promising to promote their interests in exchange for their vote. The 16th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution in 1916 was also something beneficial to the Prohibition Movement. Prior to the amendment, a large amount of government funding was brought in by taxes on alcoholic beverages. Taxes on income then took the place of taxes on alcohol after the passing of the amendment. World War I was also very beneficial to the prohibition movement. Anti-German sentiment silenced German-American opposition to prohibition. It was also claimed that prohibition could free up resources that could be used for the war effort. Particularly, it would free up grain that could be used for the war effort. Also, by 1917, more advocates of prohibition were in Congress than those opposed. This growing popularity of prohibition movements, and the war justification, although the war would end in 1918, resulted in Congress to create a new amendment for prohibition. In December, it was passed by both houses of Congress, and by 1919, only two states, Connecticut and Rhode Island, opted out of ratifying the nationwide prohibition amendment. 
Then, on October 28, 1919, Congress passed the Volstead Act in order to enforce the new 18th Amendment, and this went into effect in 1920. Thus, on January 16, 1920, Prohibition officially began when the 18th Amendment went into effect.